evening, all, and welcome to Calvar's Corner for the sixth episode of What Makes a Night. I am Lord Calvar de Guiler, Companion of the Meridian Cross, Companion of the Argent Comet, Companion of the Argent Lamp, Companion of the Falcon's Faith, and Reaper, coming to you live, as always, from the Bearing of the Osprey on the southern coast of Meridies. Now, for this series, I am joined by an absolute SCA legend. You may know him from SCA Coach's Corner or from the fighting field of Artemisia and the known world. I'd like to welcome Duke Sean Kirkpatrick Tarragon. Good evening, Your Grace. Good evening, Cal. Thanks again for having me. Um, really, really appreciate the series. I've been having a lot of good times with it, and uh, I think some folks are getting some good information out of it. Uh, so I am uh, Duke Sir Sean Kirkpatrick Tarragon. Uh, I am from the Kingdom of Artemisia. I've been a knight for 33 years um, as a knight of the Kingdom of Aidenveld before Artemisia became a kingdom. And um, I've seen uh, before Cal was alive. Um, I've seen a lot of evolution of the Order of Chivalry, certainly in our kingdom and, and parts of Aidenveld as well. And I've uh, traveled extensively and seen uh, how, how many other kingdoms uh, do it as well. And uh, tonight for this particular episode on um, Looking the Part, I'm joined by one of my former squires, uh, Sir Tierney McKendridgen. Um, so really happy to have him on board. So Tiernan, would you like to introduce yourself a bit? Uh, yeah, all. I am uh, Sir Tiernan. Uh, I've been a Knight of Artemisia for about six years. Uh, I have a, a long and, and off and on history with the SCA. Uh, I was first introduced when I was about eight years old when I saw my first uh, known world handbook. Uh, I fell in love with the idea of, of knighthood and, and being a knight and, and what a knight looked like and, and acted like at a, a very young age. Uh, about 10 years or so ago, I uh, came back to a, an on again time in my SCA time and, and met Sean. Uh, and from there, we, we had a great relationship and I aspired to him and uh, really got to learn a lot about what it really meant to, to be a knight in the SCA. So uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be part of this conversation. Excellent. Yeah, thank, thank you for being on. I, um, anyway, I, I know I, I posted on the, on the page earlier, we want to also thank uh, our previous guest and, uh, and, and thank Sir Tiernan especially for filling in sort of the last minute. Uh, Sir Tierlock was supposed to be here with us tonight and he got stuck in Texas in all of the uh, hellacious snowstorms over there. So thank you to him for being willing to, to do this initially and hopefully we can catch him for a later episode. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so tonight is looking the part. And I think... Uh, this is one of those things that it's, I didn't realize it was going to be a controversial topic. I, you know, we've had a couple of these that like I went into it expecting it to be a little controversial. Uh, I didn't realize this was going to be one of those, and it turned out to be a little bit so. I'm hoping we can uh, dispel that a bit tonight. Um, so, Sean, for you, for you, what is the, uh, I guess, the starting point, right, for looking the part for uh, the, that nightly path? Well, you know, with the thing about looking the part, um, is, uh, you know, there's in, in mundane terms, we, we talk about, you know, dressing for the, for the position to which you aspire. Um, there's the, you know, the clothes make the man sort of concept, um, and, and that sort of thing. And I think, uh, for, for us in the society, um, you know, there's, there's one of our, our local knights, uh, Duke Floki, uh, who had, who had made a comment years ago that, uh, you know, we just want you to look like something. Right. We, we, we want you to 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 look like uh, you, to be identifiable as um, an attempt at a period. Um, you know, the, the, the first episode we covered on all this was, you know, what Kapora says. And, and part of what's in Kapora is that that, uh, you know, a, a, a knight should, you know, dress the dress the part and look the part within their means. Um, and. So, but looking the part, you know, are, are you going to look like a, you know, generic, you know, uh, 80s biker knight? Um, or are you going to make some attempt to look like a 14th century knight? Um, Hold yeah, on. Cal? Pause. I'm going to need you to define 80s biker knight for me. That's a new uh, term for me. Would, would so, that be a knight that wears motorcycle boots? Because I've seen some of those. There was there was um, in in the earlier years of the society there was there were some folks that uh, that uh, looked uh, looked vaguely period I mean I mean honestly when I got knighted I was you know I was I was poor hedge knight as as well um, and you know again back in the eighties um, you know I mean the I think the costuming that we have available to us now 
um, is so much more accessible uh, than than it was before. And you know, we had the the reasonable attempts, but you know, if if you're if if you if you want to be knighted now, and and you know, you're looking like some of us did back when we got knighted in the '80s. Um, we're gonna we're gonna ask you to to to, to clean that up a little bit because um, the resources are much more available uh, uh, to do that. But you know, look like something. You know, look like something that is identifiable where you can you can say that person generically looks like you know 14th century. You know, we had and um, in, in in our last reign, um, we knighted a gentleman uh, who uh, you know there 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 may have possibly been better unbelted fighters in our kingdom, but Fedor looked like he stepped out of a page of 12th century, you know, Russian history. Right. Um, and that was one of those things that all other things being equal, that's a guy that looks like um, a, a particular period. Um, and, and, and that, that really just, it goes a long way. Um, and so, yeah, look like something, look like something identifiable. And, you know, cause that's, you know, that, that, that's part of that complete package. Um, you know, we have another one of our local knights, um, Sir, Sir Gregory of Beck, who, who had said at one point that one of his kind of personal litmus test was, you know, can you look at a person and, and imagine what they look like with a, with a white belt and a chain on? And, and, you know, how would that look on them? Um, and, you know, and that's, that, that is obviously fairly subjective and very personal uh, take on it, but, but uh, hey, look, cat butt approved. Um, but yeah, I mean, being able to to just look at somebody and imagine what they would look like as a knight um, is all part of it. Um, so, so you know, that's a that's an interesting point. Uh, I, I you probably remember this, but when I came back to the STA uh, about ten years ago, I, I decided to I wanted to do a new persona, something I really enjoy doing on occasion. And uh, at the time, I thought, man, it's going to be super cool. I'm going to be a, a seventh century Irishman. Uh, and I, I did as much research as I could at the time and realized, well, we don't really know anything about 7th century Irishmen. We know we have very little evidence of what they may or may not have worn. We have a few words here and a, and a few pictures there, but really very little. Um, and, you know, as I started putting together that persona, there was a few people that I, I talked to and maybe once in a while someone would be like, oh, hey, you're Irish, aren't you? But there just wasn't anything there. It was it was really just it didn't feel like I was actually creating a persona. And uh, one of the things that had me switch to the 14th century uh, as I, I kind of started evolving was, you know, I can recreate that. We have pictures, we have documentation, we have other people that are doing it really well. And this is something that I can go out and I can sell that I can make that a thing and, and put my own spin on it. Uh, and that to me was was really important at the time wanting to you know, evolve myself and my participation in the SCA. Right. Yeah. I, I think you, you just hit a, a really interesting little, little piece of this. And, and this is where that, and I, I mentioned this to Sean, we were talking about the thing before the show is it's, it's not the what you wear, it's the how you wear it, right? So you had clothes that you were wearing, they were probably accurate, they were probably well made, or just as well made as what you're wearing currently. But it wasn't, you didn't have the sort of the internal like drive behind it. Right. So you had to have that little bit of extra to get you in the I'm wearing a tunic, but now I'm wearing the right tunic with the right belt and the right bits and sort of like and I know and you and the important part was you knew why you were wearing all the bits. Right. So it's that knowledge of that piece, I think, really makes the difference. Um, so I think so. Yeah. So like, you know, you see a lot of like, I mean, I, I'm sitting here in my very generic Viking tunic. Right. I have no accurate persona. I don't, I don't know where I'm at. I've gotten as, you know, I'm as clean looking as I can get for a generic Viking guy that had no real sort of focus because I didn't know where I was going to go with this. Um, you know, yeah. So then I'm like, I'm moving towards being a, doing, doing Scythian and I've got this sort of Scythian nomad thing. Like I'm, I'm piecing together the, what that thing is and what those pieces are and making better conscious choices and not just trying to throw a tunic together. Right. That's the difference. I think that, that you may really made yeah. think I think is key. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, the other night on uh, Between Two Peers, Duke Valharak was on, and, and he had made the point that, um, you know, whatever you're going to do, try to look cohesive, you know, right. try, try to look like a period, uh, not eight periods, um, you know, try, try to try as much as you can in, in your armor to, to have a look, uh, to, to go for a look. And, um, 
and I, I, you know, that that cohesive look is is kind of again that says that sort of thing that separates some something off from being, you know, generic SCA chic. Um, you know, I mean, I mean for certainly for for new fighters, um, you know, I'm I'm not too concerned about what you're wearing underneath your armor. Uh, covering it up with a tabard uh, goes a long way. That 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 hides a lot of sins. Um, and you know, that tabard, if you make it look like a particular period, whether it's Viking or whether it's 14th century English, um, you know, just that, that tabard is, is going to help uh, a lot in, in going towards, you know, trying to, trying to com complete that look. Um, so yeah, look like, look like something and, uh, and, 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 you know, it's, it's the look good, feel good thing. Right. Um, you know, one, one of the, one of the things about, um, you, you know, finishing that look and and that's one of the reasons i wanted to have Tiernan on tonight because as he started getting closer to knighthood um one of the big things that i think kind of was was a big big plus for him was you know and again you cal you'd, you'd mentioned the it's not what you're wearing it it's how you're wearing it and some of that too goes to the goes to the why right, right? Like you can, you can tell when somebody starts putting that effort into, into that, they're doing it because they genuinely want to look like, um, their persona. They would, they would, they want to find a thing that they want to, to, to look at. And when you decide that you want to look that part, a lot of it just kind of falls into place because that becomes, it becomes your focus. Um, so Taryn, can you talk a little bit about, um, kind of the, the end of your journey in that regard? Well, yeah, and so you had mentioned uh, kind of that turning point for me is when I get my my arms passed, and uh, around the the time that that my arms are passed, uh, I'm reading a lot of of books about knights, and and one in particular that uh, I think a lot of us are fond of uh, is uh, Sir William Marshall, uh, and so reading through some of the stuff from his autobiographer, there's a there's a part that really stuck out to me, and and really kind of just sold like what what it's about to not just be a knight, but but what we're doing when it comes to how we look. And uh, at one point in time in, in William Marshall's life, uh, he's serving the uh, the young King Henry, and he falls out of favor with with young King Henry. Uh, he, he is accused of sleeping with the king's wife. Uh, this is really bad. You, you don't want to be accused of that. And he has to cut and run. Um, he basically decides he's going to be better off if he just takes off and goes to uh, some place where he has friends. Things will calm down. Eventually, the king will figure out it. Not only was it not happening, but the king was winning a lot more battles when he was around than without him. So he is in France at this point in time. And as you can imagine, when you're an Englishman in France, you don't have a lot of friends. Uh, it's going to maybe be some, some travel to get there. And it's really interesting. He's going to travel by himself across some very hostile area. And he makes one decision. He says, I am going to take this shield. And he takes a shield that has this very particular heraldry on it. And the story doesn't happen to mention whose heraldry it is. But he knows that as a single individual running, riding across the countryside, he will be left alone because of the power of this heraldry that he has with him. Uh, and that's really kind of important. When I started thinking about your reputation and the reputation of a household, I started really thinking like, what can I do with this? Um, I have this now, this is my stamp, right? That's that, that demonstrates us when you put on this helmet, nobody can see your face. That's how they know you are you. And Sean, you always taught me a lot about the, the panoply of a state, um, that you should, you should have a presence tournament side. Um, so I really, really thought about what do I need to do to put my stamp on this persona? Um, there's a lot of times where you may have an event that you go to the two or three states over, and that's the only time that they're ever going to see you. You want to make sure when you leave that, they remember that guy with the shamrock and the blood drops. And not just that you were a good drinker, but really that you set like a great precedent um, because ultimately, you know, if, if somebody is walking by your encampment and they see your banner, that's that, that whole, I know what I'm going to expect. I know who that is and what that is. And, and so to me, that was really kind of that whole moment where I really started putting together how important it was to have a, a cohesive persona and, and what you could do for taking elements like heraldry uh, and really selling that. 
Yeah, and that's that's something we talked about a little bit last week with Courtly Grace's is, is that look of heraldry, which also kind of gets back into the you know franchise. You know, when we look at franchise from a I'm building my own individual McDonald's, you know, concept. Um, you know, this is that you know, I, I yeah, you're putting your stamp on it, and and you're 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 hanging out your sign. You know, you're you're putting out a sign that says this is who I am and this is what you should expect. Um, and when when you do that, when you when you put out the heraldry and, and you you create that that presence and whatever that presence is, you know, whatever whatever persona you want, um, just making it you know, cohesive and looking like a thing. Because, um, yeah, once you once you once you do that and people start taking notice of that, you know, then you get the oh, you know, the guy with the blood drops and the shamrock. You know, it's like, what's his name again? Doesn't matter. I know the guy with the blood rush and, and, and the shamrock, you know, and, it's only and heraldry has a purpose. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like heraldry functions yeah. for us the same way it did in period. <laughs> with, with, uh, you know, fortunately we have a, a lot less, uh, lawsuits about heraldry that than they had in period because uh that was a whole cottage industry in, in in the middle ages was people suing each other for uh for copyright and patent infringements we, we have a whole college of the people that make sure that doesn't happen that's, that's exactly that yeah but yeah it's, it's it's making it's making that mark and putting your like turn and said putting your stamp on it and um and that's it's like french red mark, man you put that shit on everything they put that shit on everything right that's right Right. And I think an example is, you know, I, I did, you know, I, I brought my, my heraldic game today and, and my heraldry is all a little bit on everything that I'm wearing, but I rarely would wear all of this together. Like this is a great tournament look, but mm -hmm. whatever outfit I have, I can have, you know, the, the hood with a piece, or I can have, you know, the coif with a piece. It's always just having that little bit there that, that people are like, oh yeah, I remember who that person is. Um, keeping that cohesiveness, I think, especially you know, because we're talking about getting knighted and and how to sell that. When you're a squire, especially making yourself memorable is really important um, because you're trying to make those relationships. You're you're trying to find new teachers, uh, even if you have a, a squire relationship with a knight. You're still looking for other people that are going to be be forming relationships with. And if you constantly come to every event looking totally different you're not going to be as memorable as that person that is selling that particular look and, and you have really figured out how to make that your own. So I think that actually leads us to a question we had in the comments that I think that it's interesting that you literally just said no to you. Like you basically already answered the question, but I want to discuss that a little bit. Uh, let me scroll back and find it. Michael, there it is. Okay. So, is having multiple costumes or, or garb sets from different periods okay as long as each is consistent in and of itself? So I, I think you just said essentially no, right? Was your, is your opinion? So my take on it would be if your goal is just to, to have a lot of fun in the SCA and really experience all the different cultures that are available, absolutely, right? Like it, it depends on what is, what is the goal that you're going for. Uh, I liken SCA personas to a, a tattoo. Like a lot of people are like, man, I can't do it unless I have the absolute perfect one. Uh, and there's so many options out there. Which one am I going to pick? Uh, I think especially if you're if you're in that squire time where you really want to become known, you really seriously are working on on being knighted, being comfortable with with editing yourself a little bit and saying like, I'm I'm really going to go for these looks right now. Uh, in my opinion, I think that is a, a good way to go. It's, is it the only way to do it? Absolutely not. Uh, but for me personally, that's the one that I would choose. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think Jared made a made a good point about uh, you know, as, as, especially as a as a squire, if you are trying to get noticed, it is helpful for for people to be able to to look at you and say, "Look for this is the guy you're looking for." Um, but uh, but I think I think it is you know ultimately uh, it, it is it is more important you know if if you are going to do several uh, different outfits because why not right but if you're if you're going to do that then try to have you know as as the question said try to be consistent within you know each each set of of garb that you're wearing um, you know uh, you know it could be the you know oh you you, you didn't recognize Tiernan today because he decided to do the viking thing you know mm -hmm. instead of the 14th century thing but it still looks like something 
right? And I think I think this goes more uh, towards uh, the 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 look of a fighter on the on the field. You know, try to, in in your fighting harness, try to be as consistent as you can because you know most of us most of us don't have like eight suits of armor that we're going to wear for for different occasions. You know, we got the one thing, and you're going to see that and you know, if you're if you're if you're wearing a um, if you're wearing a, a, a Spanish Morian helmet um, and uh, you know and lamellar and German Gothic fluted legs and uh, you know Bazabans you know on your arms, I mean that's a that's a suit of armor that's going to be all over the place. Right. Um, and so try to be as consistent as you can, uh, especially in your fighting, uh, get as much as as much as possible. So again, you have you have that look. And it is, as far as I'm concerned, it's per perfectly fine for you to have a fighting kit that looks like a thing at, that may be completely different from what your off the field persona may be. You know, right. you, you might like the court dress of the 14th century and you might like the fighting look of, of uh, 10th century um, Viking or Norse, right? Um, and so, you know, I, th I think there's definitely some room for, for that as long as each of those things is consistent and they, they they look consistent within that within that set well there's another part of the consistency as well and again this is where the, i think the heraldry plays in and it's harder for the non like european personas right so let me let me let me speak as someone who's working on scythian stuff right now heraldry right. is not a thing scythians had the japanese didn't have it at least not in the same way that the english did the right. chinese didn't have it the mongols didn't have it right? so they didn't use heraldry but the, the C in SCA means creator, right? So if you're going to take a, if you're going to do a Viking persona or a, a Middle Eastern persona or something, or even just a garb, I, we're, I'm using the word persona sort of loosely, you know, dress, right? right? Um, make sure it's all consistent throughout your wardrobe, right? Yes, it's a Middle Eastern set, but it's still, you know, yellow with red blood drops and green shamrocks somewhere in it. It's going to look different than the European version of that, right? Because you want to stick to the Middle Eastern flair, but use some of the same elements or the same colors. And then when you go to the Viking, it's the same blood drops, but they're in knot work and the shamrocks are knot work instead of regular, right? But you still have the shamrocks there. You still have your, see, your core pieces. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a way to do that consistently across that, yes, it's a little harder and you got to sort of, sort of think outside of the box a little bit, but it's part of that. It's that little extra effort that makes it consistent. Uh, and you said something about the whole your fighting kit versus soft gear versus off the field kit, right? I think that's a really interesting thing to look at because it's really difficult to get recognized for your prowess on the field if nobody knows who the hell you are off the field. Yep. So if you if you're out there wearing you know full face helmet, full armor, you know, and you're a 14th century knight on the field, but then you're wearing a Viking soft kit out in the out in the tavern, nobody's going to connect the two. So yeah. unless you do. Make the and, and yeah, and, that, and I think that that becomes more more important um, or, or a bigger factor as an unbelted fighter because you are trying to make a name for yourself and you're trying to get known. You know, it's very different for the for those of us who have, who have been knighted for a while. You know, who you know most of what I do is is 14th century costuming. Um, but um, in our last reign, my wife decided that she wanted to go more with uh, some of the the Rus, uh stuff. So. You know, uh, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm making apron dresses and, and, you know, getting turtle brooches, you know, I can, I can do that. Right. I can, I can make that swing and, um, and I, I can, I can, you know, give my wife the wardrobe that she wants and, and, you know, or find the people who can, um, we can do that. And, you know, I think most of the coronations that we've had have, have all had a very different, um, a different style to them. Um, and we can do that. I'm, I'm a well enough established knight that it's easy for me to, to, to do something because it's fun. For an unbelted fighter who's trying to get noticed, um, it, I think it, it is, and I, I don't want to say that it's an end-all be-all, but it certainly helps for, like you said, for people to be able to say, you know, you, you can't miss them. This is what they look like. This is, this is their period they're going for. So you walk into a room and you look for, you know, your 12th century Russian, you know, unbelted fighter. And that's, you know, you're, you're probably getting close to the, to, to the guy that we're looking for. Right. Yep. No, that's a, I think that's a great point. 
Yeah, He's I always wanted it to be really easy. I know Sean was always looking for a good fight for me. I wanted it to be hit, hit, it to be really easy. Go look for the guy with the shamrock and the blood drops, and go give him a good fight. You know, it was it was never going to be difficult for for him to make sure that that he could feed me that next good fight that I needed to learn from. Uh, you know, you you talked about being repeatable, and and one thing I did early on when I I painted my first shield, I made a template. I made a uh, a template that every time I paint my shield, it was exactly the same. Right. I took that same template, made my first sir coat. It was exactly the same as it was on my shield. I mean, that might be extreme to some people, but this is the Middle Ages, especially for someone doing a, a high medieval. They were stamping all over that, and that was totally okay. Um, we see it all the time in the manuscript. So definitely worth taking the time to figure out uh, what that element is. And it's funny you say Norse because I'm actually looking at building a Norse persona right now. Uh, I'm totally into it. And the first thing I thought is, how do I get shamrocks and blood drops in there? I know I can do it. I got to just figure out the way to make it look appropriate. Right. Uh, luckily, they like to decorate stuff. So that's going to be pretty easy. We can, we can decorate all kinds of things. Uh, it won't be the same. But I think at the end of the day, you'll people will still know that that's Sir Tiernan um, because you know, that's, that's my brand at this point. Right. Right. And again, like Sean said, you're, you are probably now well known enough that you don't have, you can take a little bit of a risk, right. And shift to another persona because you have nothing to prove. Like you're not trying, you have nothing to gain at this point. Right. You, you, you have, you've achieved, you can now play a little more. Right. Yeah. And I think, and that's, and I, I, I was speaking as the, as the, as the unbelt owner, I think that's, that's where it's tougher for, for this side of that, of that belt is, we have to make that little extra effort because, you know, if you do that and don't do it well, nobody cares, right? Nobody's really going to, you're not losing anything. Whereas if I do that and don't do it well, I've now lost some sort of effort somewhere. It may not be a huge yeah. loss. I'm a pretty well-known guy. Like I'm a pretty recognizable face. So like, I'm not worried either, but like not everybody has that, that sort of extra leg up it being a, you know, the loud six foot five dude in the room. Like people can find me generally. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think it's I think it's important to point out too that I mean it I mean it it is it is somewhat unfortunate that 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 is that consistency is so much more important as an unbelted fighter but I mean the whole the whole point of this is you are trying to be recognized um and that takes some some work for for people to 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 figure out who you are um, and if you look like somebody different every time you go to an event and then, you know, these people are spending all their time that, you know, they want, they've heard about you and they want to get to know you. And now you're dressed in, in your Germans. Um, and you know, next week you're in your Italians and, and like, and it's, it's just, it is, it is difficult to, to, to kind of keep track of what's going on. And so, you know, I, I, I hesitate to put too much emphasis on, you know, you got to do it this, this one way, but I, it's just the reality of, you know, as, as, as Magda had pointed out the comment you brought up earlier, you are establishing your brand, right. You know, and in, in, in order for people to know what that brand is, it has to be consistent. Yeah. I will say, I think maybe Facebook and YouTube and other internet things have made this easier. Because if you know you're gonna have six different persona sets or six different clothing sets, and all of them are visible on your website or on your Facebook or on your Instagram or whatever, because I'm guessing here that when the Knights of the Known World start looking at a candidate, they're gonna go look at their social media. Because why not, right? You go do some research. I would. I'm I'm gonna one day, right? So if they go look at, oh look, cool. He oh he does German stuff. Oh he does Italian. Stuff. Oh cool. So you can get an idea of what all you're looking for. So if you go looking for the German guy, but he's wearing the Italian that day, you've at least seen it at that point. So if you're going to do that, make the effort to make sure that's known and you don't just keep it in your closet. Yeah. All right. So a bit of a transition, or sort of I guess an extension of this question. We got a question early on from uh, from Dale Hopton. Uh, so over the last few years, and sort of, and John, I think this is a question that I think the, I, I want. I'm curious of your you know, 30 years ago versus, you know, even 10 years ago now, what the difference is. Um, have we seen more of a drive for historical kit, right? So we, with the with the resources we have now, has obviously, I, I'm, I'm, the easy answer is probably going to be yes, right? Have we seen more of a drive for that? But then how do we encourage it without shaming those who can't do it, right? Again, money is always yeah. a factor here. So how do we get that, uh, sort of find that sweet spot? Uh, so um, we've come a long way. 
in in 30 plus years um and we have the 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 resources are much more accessible now to to understanding what is period appropriate and that sort of thing and quite frankly the the materials are much more accessible too i mean you know i can i can go to fabricstore.com and get 100 linen for ten dollars a yard um which for for me to make a box and tunic i can do that in two and a half yards for so for 30 bucks i got a tunic that's going to last me for 10 years um so those materials are much more accessible now than than they were um 30 years ago um you know you got boots by bohemian where you know bohemian has a whole shop of period boots and they are the gold standard in in boots and they are reasonably priced um and he's he's put together shoes and boots that are accessible right where you can have period looking shoes um at, at an accessible price point right so the resources are, are absolutely like so much better than they than they were um you know 30 years ago and i think that that does make it a lot easier to i, I think the I, I think as far as his, historical uh costuming goes and as historical fighting kits goes um i think um people are seeing more of them and because it's because like period shoes is like like bohemian's boots are everywhere you know and they're like that guy looks like you know he's wearing a Jorvik boot where'd you get the Jorvik boot go see that guy right um and because we see them so much more it's a lot easier to say where'd you get that and i want to and i mean there's so much more of i want to look like that person right there right? that's that's who i want to look like um and so yeah as far as the the historical accuracy goes far far better than it was far more accessible than it was but um we still need to keep room for the reasonable attempt at pre-17th century costuming right we need to allow that um there there are i mean uh you know getting to making a you know making a tunic out of 100 percent linen that is an evolution that is that is a process um that is not the entry point um by the time you're 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 getting knighted or by the time you're you're being looked at seriously as a as a candidate, that may very well be one of those final touches that people are going to really take notice of. Right. But certainly in the beginning, we we absolutely have to keep room. You know, again, if that guy has armor that 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 he made out of pickle barrel armor because he got free pickle barrels, um, we need to have room for that for that fighter. Just put a tunic on it. You know, right. uh, a little bit of fabric covers a lot of sin um so and i think i think that was a comment that joel made earlier you know a little bit of fabric goes a long way right just cover that up um but yeah we can't you know as 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 the question says we we cannot um be shaming people for not uh, for for not for not starting where we finish right um i definitely expect that people are going to look better now um, if you're looking at getting knighted, if you're if you're expecting to be a knight candidate and part of that discussion, yes, I expect your costuming and your fighting kit to look better than mine did 33 years ago. Um, yeah, the, the, we, the, we we have to leave room for that. Raised, right. Yeah. The starting point's still where it was, but the the bar for knighthood is now higher than it was previously. This bar yeah. should never move. This bar and, can. And, you, yeah, you're right. I mean, because I mean, we we have to have room for fringe, for the for the fringe players who aren't aren't really invested in, um, you know, paying paying the membership. You know, I mean, membership uh, always always helps our organization. But for for those people that just kind of want to be weekend warriors and just go to wars and and just have a good time there, we need to make room for that. Um, that that we 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 still have to have that. Um, but yeah, when you when you're looking when you're talking about somebody who wants to be Knighted, um, there there is a there is a greater expectation now, and there should be. Well, and that's the important distinction, right? We're not talking about. We should never be talking about shaming people for making an attempt, showing up at their first event in their fairy fair dress, and and just wanting to get the experience of the SCA. But if you're serious about being knighted, honestly, you're probably going to have to get rid of your full plate blue plastic barrel, and I don't think that that. 
that's really a bad thing to to say, you know, because because most people that are are looking at getting knighted, you you're not talking about a one or two year process. You're for most of us, you're talking about multiple years of of learning and practicing. There should be some evolution over that time, and I think that's something that a lot of us as knights want to see is that you're getting drawn in. You really care about that point and place and time that you want to recreate. Uh, and that you're taking the time to actually do that, uh, especially nowadays. You know, if, if, as as we've said already, if you go back to the '90s, there's a completely different standard, uh, and that's okay. That was a completely different world that we lived in back then. Nowadays, though, we have the the resources. Um, you can go to major commercial websites and get historically accurate gear. Places like Grimfrost are putting out real historical gear for good prices. This is easy to go find. So the the bar is a little lower for just getting into that originally. Um, so especially if you really want something like knighthood, you should really be considering, I want my kid to be as good as I can personally make it. And that's going to be different for every person. Uh, and there shouldn't be any shame in your kit is not full stainless steel plate mail like somebody else's. That's OK to have those sort of differences. Right. But but also no, I think part of that's the choices you make too, right? So so the the if you're going to be a 14th century English persona, and you want to be a 14th century English, you know the classic cliche knight, that's going to be more expensive, right? You can't do that as cheaply as you could, uh, you know, an earlier period ruse kit. Like it's just a that's a choice thing, right? So if if you know if you're getting into that, like okay, that's going to cost more money, so I can't do that right now. So you have to do a different or, or do it a different way, right? You have to sort of make those those conscious efforts and do what you gotta do. Um, go ahead, start yeah. Well, and, and again, you know, when you're when you're looking at uh, you know, a little bit of fabric going a long way, I mean, most uh, a good good portion of my armor now is uh, ABS plastic and hockey armor. Um, but you don't see it, you know. I, I, I fight in my fighting tunic is is basically uh, is based on the boxing tunic. The look I'm going for is um, very similar to the Captel de Book in uh, at uh, Battle of Poitiers in 1356. Um, and generically, um, yeah, I, I I get close enough to that for uh, for for my needs, and also consider that. Uh, my fighting kit ha has to be under a certain weight limit, so I can I can fly with my armor to uh, to go teach fighting. So those are some considerations uh, that I have, and you know, again, that all kind of goes back to that that look, look like something, be consistent about it. Um, I'm not overly concerned about what's uh, what's underneath it, um, but uh, you know, I, I I'm more concerned about the why, and I'm more concerned about. You know, generally speaking, I think, you know, the, the newer, the, the brand new fighter that gets started, you know, yeah, we have to make room for them to do that. But when we're talking about somebody that is interested in being a knight, I think there is is generally going to be a desire to want to be more period anyway, because that's kind of what the whole thing is is, is about. And so I think that's that's generally an easy sell. Um, you, you, we don't we don't we don't really have to convince, you know, aspiring knights um that you know it's like this pickle barrel thing you got going on you know that's that's everywhere um those people want to be better you know, right. they, they they want they want to they want to wear more and the 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 ones that never get to that point and they don't they don't want to that's fine too just come to the event because more people is more better come to the event put on your stuff fight you know fight have a good time drink you know all that good stuff just don't expect to be a knight Right. Yeah. That, yeah. There's, there's, it's like we have to draw that line somewhere. Right. And, and that's a, that's a thing. Uh, so uh, another comment came up is the idea of we don't have to purchase all of it. People will help you make it. Uh, I know. So uh, yeah. Aston Knights Live last week, um, uh, Sir Finbar, super amazing guy out of Glen Albin. He, he's a magician when it comes to metal. He just does stuff. And he's like, oh, you need a helmet? All right. Come over here. I'll show you. And he'll teach you how to do it. He will yeah. not do it for you. But he'll walk you through step by step and, and stand there while you do it and you'll get it done and it'll be perfect. And it'll be amazing. And you'll love every second of it. So, yeah, there are a hundred people out there that will help you make things, you know, as as inexpensively as possible for the cost of materials or less. Because half the time they've got a pile of sheet metal sitting in their garage somewhere that yeah. they're they're frankly just ready to get rid of. So they'd love for you to come over and, and, and take some of it and put it into a helmet or, or armor or whatever. So reach out. And, and you know what? Artists artists like to do trades. True. You know, because the reality is the the uh, 
generic uh, SEA member, you know, doesn't have the doesn't have the money to pay our, our artists what their time is actually worth. Um, <laughs> they, we just like money money doesn't trade that way. Um, but you know, if you know somebody that does costuming, and you know you you and who knows somebody else who does armoring, you can make a swap. You know, you if if you have if you have certain skills, I mean, you know, you you can trade your skills uh, for the for the pieces that you need. Um, and you know, I think that's a that's a super important part of all this is that, you know, you don't have to break the bank to be able to do this. Um, you know, natural fibers are great. You know, linen looks, linen is great. Wool is great. Silk, those are all, you know, very neat, very period and very expensive, right? You, you can get a similar look at, or with that 10 foot rule. You can get a similar look with cotton, you know, and, you know, let's face it, when we're talking about somebody, you know, wanting to be nightly and you get that look at 10, 20 feet away where they look nightly, nobody cares whether or not, you know, whether or not their fabric is, is natural fibers. We're not, we're not asking you to be a laurel. We're asking you to look like something. Right. And so there are a lot of ways that, that you can do that on your own. There are a lot of ways that you can trade for the things uh, that you need. Um, and yeah, it's 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 just super super important to point out that we're not asking you to break the bank. We're we're not asking you to to money roll this somehow. Um, just gotta you gotta try. Um, it, it's important to point out too that the skill you're trading doesn't have to be art. It doesn't have to be anything more than join somebody's guard and carry their thrones. Guess what? If you want to be a knight, we expect to see you doing that sort of stuff anyway. And at the end of the day, those people whose court you're helping out are probably going to be the kind of people that can help you get garb or know people that do make those social connections and, and just be somebody that people want to be around and, and you're willing to help and, and you're going to, to see a lot of doors open. Um, it doesn't just have to be like, I have a skill to trade. Your, your trade can be sweat equity. And sometimes that, that's really important to people. Yeah. You know, that's an amazing segue to our next episode, actually, on networking. <laughs> it's almost like these connect together. It's weird. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's all like they're all related somehow. <clears throat> yeah. Networking right. and cultivating relationships. So to, to get us off of armor for a second, I have a, I have a, a controversial topic I want to bring up. And I'm going to say a thing, and then I'm going to run away from it. And you're all going to, like, throw rocks <laughs> in my head. Okay. So something I think that the LARP community does better than the SCA is accessories with like reason, right? So we talk about garb and we talk about armor, but we often don't talk about the accessories and the extra little bits that really, if you look, think about all the people you know and go, man, that guy really looks the part. Oh man, that guy, oh yeah, she's really put together. It's never the garb. It's always the extra things. It's the belts and the chains and the pouches and the, the widgets and the doodads that really make the difference. And so something I noticed when I was, when I was LARPing, I, I have a pretty extensive LARP background. Yes, I'm a giant nerd. I love throwing spell packets in the woods. Get off me. Nerds, nerds, um, nerds, nerds. Right. Um, but like, so because in that, you had like magic items and all your items had to look like what they were in the game, you had to make intentional choices with your costume because everything meant something. If you wore a certain color of this or that, it was all intentional, right? But it, so it, it all meant things. So something I brought with me to the SCA is when I have a thing, I'm wearing a thing for a reason. Yes, it may be to hold my phone because I need to hide my phone somewhere or I need to have a bag because this or that, right? But like, you know, I'm not going to be carrying around a bow and arrow and like, a, you know, a full quiver of arrows the entire day at an SCA event. I have no need for that on a regular event. But I may still want to wear like some sort of like quiver like bag that I can use for carrying my, you know, uh, notebook around, right? Intentional accessories. So what do you guys think about that? What, what, what are your thoughts on accessories? Go ahead, Jaren. Well, so uh, I'll go ahead and start. Honestly, I, I think that's fantastic. It, it, it reminds me of uh, something I saw on Facebook a couple of years ago. It was this kind of this uh, rubric around if you're a peer in the SCA, you should have this, this many accessories plus one. And it was kind of funny, but but when you really think about it, when you when you do look at people that you think, man, 
that's somebody I really want to to emulate. Uh, and I think a lot of what we do as humans is try to emulate other people. And, and as you're looking at, I want to become a knight, you should probably be looking at other knights and say, what is it that, that makes them different? Uh, and accessories, I think, is is hugely important. Uh, something that we forget about because you you can really get lost in, in medieval fashion is that people in the Middle Ages actually lived. They had to do things day to day. And so if you're wearing your most ridiculous, you know, 14th century French court garb to set up your tent, you're probably not doing it right because they wouldn't have done that either. And so really thinking about your accessories for what I am doing today and, and who I am portraying and what I need to get done and, and do these things actually work? Can I live in this? Uh, I think that's great. I, I think that's really uh, an important way to kind of dot that I and cross that T, if you would, when you're really trying to create a, a persona. Yeah, I mean, it, it turns out the uh, the the coif that uh, the Tarnan is wearing tonight uh, makes wearing a coronet super comfortable. Um, and if you're, yeah, if you're if you're crowned somewhere, having that coif on, and when you're when you're doing business, that that sort of thing makes uh, makes wearing that brass hat a little more bearable. Um, and and it's one of those things that is like super totally period. We have tons of documentation for for that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I mean all the all the little accessories and and you know we have one of our uh, one of our our heralds in our kingdom. Um, my good friend, Mistress Fiametta, um, she has a um, she's made a, a a little book that she has that she puts her phone in so that she can open up the book and the camera sticks out on the other side. So oh, yeah. standing by standing behind the thrones, she can open up her little book that looks like period book and she can be taking pictures yep. of, of people that are getting awards like three feet from her. Um, you know. Those are the functional types of accessories that um, are not a distraction, um, that that have a period look about them, uh, that that can, you know, I mean, pres preserving those moments on on, on film um, are is really important, and you know, being able to have a device that kind of conceals that so it's not obvious and it's not a distraction um, certainly adds to that that kind of dream culture that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, you know, creating that environment. Um, that, that, um, that is creating the environment where, where those moments are more likely to happen, where, where those, those dream moments, that, that, that moment where you really feel like you are a 14th century English knight, um, at one of these events, um, and all of those accessories, it, it is the, de the, the devils in the details as the little things that, um, that, that make all those moments, uh, much more likely to happen. Well, it, it, it translates to more than just your garb and just your person too. It, it talks about the camp stuff. That's one of the things that uh, Sir Joffrey does a, a real great uh, class demonstration, I guess, on sort of making a period encampment, but doing it in ways that are not really like, you know, not how, not how stuff is a hundred percent period accurate or all the, even the same exact period. But when you walk into his camp, you're like, holy shit, this is like, you feel it either, right? Yeah. And it's, it's little things like he has like incense burning and a little incense burner. They may not have done that or they might have, but that thing makes us feel more medieval because it's just that little thing in the corner and gives you that smell of that, that, that rosin and you know, that effect. Um, you know, he has a little like uh, box that he's made holes on that he puts his phone or speaker in so that he can have some medieval music just playing in the background, but there's not an obvious speaker sitting on his table, you know? Those little things like that are all about looking the part, right? He's not he's not carrying that around all day, but it still makes him look better because yeah. he's sitting next to those things. Yeah, because because looking the part really comes down to uh, helping to create the environment right. for for everybody else. Um, and when you when you when you make that effort to you know, especially as an as and as as an aspiring unbelted fighter, you know you you were going to be seen in court a lot more than 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 you know most of the most of the folks um you know in the SCA if if you're you know for us our our, our queen's champion um is selected by tournament and our queen's champion is unbelted list only um and queen's champion marches in 
she you know processes into court with with the queen um you know and they 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 stand stand guard by the thrones uh while while court is happening people see that mm -hmm. and you know when you're dressing the part uh standing up there representing the queen um people take note of that sort of stuff and you are you're you're creating helping to create that environment where it is believable that that we are in that period court yeah. so there's a there's a book i've heard of and unfortunately i haven't read it but uh apparently it's by i, I believe he's a professor who who did a thesis that said that the sca is actually uh improvisational theater uh it's spontaneous improv theater and it's really true when and Sh and Sean has even used the word several times of dressing the part and really think about like you are on stage when you walk into that event and and what part is it that you want to portray um, you know when you're talking about your encampment you're setting a scene very literally and you're you're setting the scene for a, a medieval squire's encampment in your mind what does that look like and and how is it that when somebody else walks past that can you help bring them to that place? And you know that is a lot of what helps create the the magic in the SCA. It really kind of pulls us along and and makes us for just a minute lets us forget that uh, we're living in the the mundane world. All right. So we had two questions come in about accessories. Right, what a comment and an accessory. Um, so accessories are great. Just don't make don't wear the bat belt. That's that's a good point. Uh, yeah, if you're gonna wear them, wear them. Uh, Again, make conscious efforts. Uh, there are ways to wear a thousand things on your person. Just you know, figure out how your persona will wear them. Uh, but the all the Norse treasure necklaces, you can yeah. have hanging off of those. They were they were functional. It's called they're, they're called chatelaines. Actually, that's it's one of the reasons we call it chatelaine. So yeah, find find your way your persona would have wore their stuff because they traveled around. So figure it out. It doesn't have to be on the belt. Um, the next and yeah, the question was, what are our thoughts on sunglasses or glasses? Uh, I think the easy question is, wear your glasses. We have to yeah. wear your glasses. Don't, don't, right? Um, I, don't, don't wear your god awful green Ray Bans. Like, if you can help it, get you a pair of like. If you're gonna wear sunglasses, because especially if you need to, or it's a bright sunny day, and like you're out in the archery range, cool. Wear sunglasses, but like, go find some ones that are like low key, so it is less yeah. boring. I think that's the important part. Yeah, we had uh, one of one of our nights years ago before he before he got LASIK. Um, he was, you know, one of our marshals, and and he was marshaling the field in a pair of sunglasses, prescription sunglasses. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're if you're outside and you have light sensitivity um, and you have prescription sunglasses, then yeah, by all means, um, the the glasses that I that I typically wear are um, are uh, the transition lenses, and you know, if I'm inside for court and then i walk out the building and i get you know hit with that blast of sun rays whoosh, eyes go dark i mean yeah i mean wear, wear your glasses absolutely i mean that's 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 one of those things that i don't think it all all detracts but you know like cal said you know the ray-bans and the oakley's you know be be a little more judicious in in uh, when and why uh, you're wearing those things because those those are things that that appear to be very modern um, that that can detract uh, from from setting that scene. Right, so you know, oh, sorry, Tanner. Say, speaking of accessories, you can always get a hat, nice hat with a big brim on it, and you can you can avoid those sunglasses. And now you've got another cool accessory to go with your kit. Hat, hats are in fact the pr primo accessory. That is that's honestly one of the reasons I I, I chose the Scythian persona to move to is because they have the coolest hats. <laughs> <laughs> or no, the Scythians have the coolest hats. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Kind of the, the idea is again, we have technology. We're going to use it. Like, I get not everybody had like I, I have to have my phone on me. It's a it's a comfort thing. Like I'm going to have my phone on me. But it's going to be put away in a pouch, and I'm only going to pull it out when I need it. Like I, if I have my watch on, I'm going to have it behind my tunic so you never see it. But like when I'm doing like sight herald stuff, I need to actively know what time it is, right? So. Do things like that to to disguise those things, but still keep them on you because we, we we live in a modern thing, a modern society where we all have jobs we have to go to, or we're on call, or we've got kids, or whatever. Those things are all okay. Don't don't ever yeah. let that. And anybody, and and I'll speak for for all the good people in the world. Nobody ever gives you crap about that. Send them to Sean. He'll tell them. Yeah, I'll take care of. Them. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, we all we all have phones that that keep us connected. Um, but standing in the middle of the feast hall 
having a conversation on your on your cell phone. Yeah, I mean no. that's that 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 detracts. You know, um, you know, step outside. You know, step down the hall. You know, towards the bathrooms or wherever. I mean, take take that take that somewhere else. Um, you know, because again, it's just you know you, you you can be dressed to the nines, and if you're standing in the middle of the hallway, you know, thumbing through Facebook on your on your phone, that that takes away from the whole the whole scene. Right. Agreed. All right, man. We are just under an hour. Do we, do we have any other questions I've missed in the chat? I've been trying to keep up. I just spent a lot of comments. So <laughs> it's kind of hard to, <laughs> hard to see. That's what I love about the show is we get like, I, I have, like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pay attention to what you guys are talking about, but also there's so much going on in the comments. I'm trying to actively keep track of them. Like there's so many people talking. I love it. Which, um, yeah. Which like I said, by the way, we, we really appreciate all the, all the, all the comments, um, both on the YouTubes and, and on the Facebook. We really appreciate everybody chiming in on, on, on the discussion. Cause really ultimately this is, this is a discussion. It's not a lecture. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons that, like, I, you know, I, I'm I'm clearly not a professional. Sean is, whereas he's been doing it literally longer than I've been alive. He's not even a professional here. None of us are getting paid to do this. This is our hobbies. Uh, there are three different opinions in this room, and, and you're going to get probably four more opinions when you ask any other person. So there are a hundred ways to do this. Don't don't expect us to be the you know, be all. That's why we love having these discussions and why this series has had and will have eight different guests with eight different opinions by eight different topics or at nine now even. Because yeah. we want to show that there are different ways to do this. Yep. Um, let's see. So yeah, so we talked about accessories. We talked about uh, you know doing armor on the cheap, uh, making conscious choices. I think we've I think we've covered. Oh, actually no. So so, Taryn, you brought up something a minute ago, and, and I, I sort of hit on it with the LARPing idea. So we talk about LARPing. We talk about setting the stage and sort of playing the part. What are some things we do? And I, I mentioned this in the sort of show intro or in the, uh, the post about like the, the things you do, right? So we've talked about clothing and the what you were wearing. What about the things you do? So like how you do your salutes or things you say or, you know, sort of those efforts. What are some things we can do to improve ourselves that way? Uh, so, you know, for me, that was one that I, I always took uh, really seriously. I think it's a lot of fun, um, especially the high middle ages when you're when you're doing a, a 14th century persona. Uh, really, anyone that is that would have been at a tournament or, or tournament ad adjacent, you, you have a lot of opportunity for actual acting. Um, and so something that I always love to do uh, when we would have bigger tournaments, uh, not necessarily like a crown, but uh, there was a there was one that we did for a while that was just very much a 14th century uh, tournament event. Uh, the name escapes me right now, but I would go out and give these these ridiculous challenges to people. Uh, and I would do it very loudly and and really make sure that I was getting the attention of the crowd. Um, creating a show um, because it, it really kind of sets the, the standard. Like you, we talked a lot about wanting to be memorable. And while to your opponents on the field, you might be memorable for the fight. Uh, maybe you're memorable because you made some really cool clothes. How else do you make yourself memorable to people? And um, so that was something that was always important to me. Um, when it came to uh, before a fight with my consort, um, I would always walk up to her, I would try to take her out on the field if it was an option, uh, and I would kneel down and I would I would dedicate my fights that day to her. And while that interaction was just between her and I, I it was public enough that I knew somebody was seeing this night with this lady on his knee, uh, making that scene of like, this is this is chivalry, this is what it means to go out and do this, is, is to make that dedication. So I think that's great to talk about what are the actions that add to that you know you've got to look now how do you act around this yeah likewise i mean um you, you mean everybody has a camera on the in their in their pocket now right everybody has a high definition camera and video and they're in their right in their pocket and people are always taking pictures and you never know who it is and when you take that time to to do those things you know i mean the the salute in the tournament uh, for me is, is one of those moments that, um, that where, where I think people are most likely to, to want to take that photo because, um, 
you know, when I, when I make my salutes in a tournament, um, I, you know, I, I salute the crown standing up and I salute my opponent standing up and I take a knee only for my inspiration. Mm -hmm. And when I take that knee, I'll take a moment. Um, and that's, that's a, a, a bit of a, just a, a pause for myself, uh, to be able to kind of collect my thoughts before I go into that particular fight. Um, and then as soon as I stand up and I, you know, the, the last thing I see before I engage combat is, is my wife. Um, and that whole process that I go through is, you know, it is, it is ritualized for me. Right. And, and, and it's part of, you know, every, every time I go into a fight in a tournament, everything has to be the same as much as possible. Um, that, that's all part of, that's, that's, that's all part of the, the execution. Um, but the very last thing for me is seeing my wife, uh, before I engage in combat. And I think you can, you can see it. Um, you can see it and you can feel it. You can, you can, you can feel my, my love and devotion for my wife in, in that moment when I'm taking that salute, when I'm recognizing her right before I go destroy somebody. Um, and those are those moments that, you can see that in that picture and <clears throat> you know some of my favorite pictures are making salutes either to my wife or to my opponent um and uh you know that's that's one of those things that again you're setting that stage and you never know who's watching you never know when somebody is going to look at you make that salute or or, or you know when you kill your opponent and you, you know, you, you help them up, you know, and, and how you, how you conduct yourself with your opponent in victory or in defeat, you know, those are the moments that people are going to see and they're going to say, I want to be like that. Yeah. The, the, it's, it's, it's weird how those little things make such a difference. Right. So yeah, the, the, so I, I always make a habit as when, when my opponent falls, I always salute as they fall. When, yeah. when, you know, once, once I disengage and like, and I realize that I've won, like I always try to, I, I make another salute and it's always just a little thing. Right. But it's, it's a conscious effort of me acknowledging the defeat, acknowledging the you right. know, both. Like, like that's a thing I do for me. Yeah. And I realized later, I was like, Oh, that's a thing that looks cool from the sidelines. Like I, yeah. you know, I, didn't, I didn't do it intentionally. I did it for me. It was a me acknowledging a, a, the, the, the end of the fight. Um, but yeah, yeah that's, that, that is absolutely absolutely some, something I do as well. I always I always acknowledge my opponent because really without my opponent, I mean, what's the point? That's right, right. And and whether they you know whether they they whether I win or lose, um, or especially when I win, um, yeah, you you have to give thanks to to your opponent. Yeah. You know? Now an, another another place to 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 really I, I think ham it up, right? So so the tournaments are obviously the that's, we're we're on stage as fighters. And that, that is our platform. We're out there by ourselves or, or with our, our dance partner and doing the thing, right? Another part, another spot is court, right? So court is literally a production. It's a play. Like, it's a play within the play. And it's not just on the crown to be the, the playing people up there. You, as a person being called into court, are a part of that. Um, so I know the, the people that I always remember the most, uh, we have uh, our, our – and, and I'll, I'll speak to, like, not to disparage the Knights of the Kingdom uh, – our the order of defense does that better. They put on a show when they come into court, right? Now most of our of, of our mods are are very late period, and they do like like the the Italian like mobster sort of personas, right? So when they come into court, it's the big feathers and the hats and it's, it's the floofy things, and they make a production of it, right? Usually they come in in pairs, and it's it's always a big thing. I think that's something any of us can do, right? It's a little extra effort. Right. And, and, and you know, I and I get, and I know not everybody is quite as, as magnanimous and quite as large as persona wise or you know people wise as some of us are. Um, but when you when you do a thing, so like approach the thrones, stop, do your bow, approach, bow again, take a knee, like do it intentionally, right? I know it's it's really easy to sort of get in the habit of oh yeah that's just uh, it's just Sean he's just giving me another award whatever cool I'm getting a thing like it becomes commonplace especially as you're as you get older in the society it's all right what award am I getting today or what what am I getting yelled at about today cool right yeah. no right that kid sitting over there that's their first court and if they see you acting blasé about it 
they now don't think this is cool anymore because their person they look up to because you're some cool adult that they really like isn't putting the effort in. But if you stop and make a deal of it, it doesn't have to be a grandiose effort, but you make the effort to acknowledge your crown, make the effort to acknowledge the Baron and Baroness. And, you know, those little things can make such a difference. And it's all part of that looking the part. Yeah, we have uh, we have an order in our kingdom that's uh, the order of the King's Council, um, which is um, personal recognition from from the sovereign um, to those who have been particularly beneficial in their council um, throughout throughout their reign. Um, and having some of my squires having one crown uh, and and having had some input and influence on, on some of our other crowns, um, that is an award that I've I've been uh or i've received frequently um with, with, without without tooting the horn too much um it's it's something something that it, that i've that i've gotten frequently um and it is deeply meaningful to me every time right. you know i i'm you know i'm not going to get called into court and say well you know it's where i get my king's counsel so you know i can just kind of yuck it up um you know, because because I having having been crowned, uh, I understand how deeply personal that particular order is. It's something that that I I, I usually only hand out to to a few people because there are only a few people that are, that have made that kind of impact on on our reign. Um, and uh, so I I know how personal that is, and I'm not going to I'm not going to diminish that. Uh, for for those that have chosen to recognize me with that, and I am going to make that production because you know generally that happens at, at either the 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 it happens near the end of the rain, you know possibly even that last court. So when I get called up in that last court, <clears throat> who knows what it may be? But you know I I am going to try to make that that production because I know how important it is to them, and I want people to see that it is equally important to me. So that that goes to exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah, I think it's a, a good thing to remember that that being called up in court, whether it's for an award, whether it's for to give an announcement, whatever it might be, like you have an opportunity right right then to help create part of that show. Uh, and just taking a minute to be intentional about how you approach that uh, is really important because, you know, you never know, like, like we were talked about with fighting, you don't know who's watching, you don't know if it's their first event giving them that opportunity to, to really feel like, wow, this is what it's all about. We, we talk about the magic a lot in, in the SCA and uh, being able to be one of those people that helps create that magic if for a minute is a privilege. And, and so I think it's worth taking that that extra bit of effort to, to think about it that way. I, I think intentional is the word of the night. I think that is the sort of defining point of this is intentional choices, intentional effort, intention matters more than a lot yeah. of the rest of it does. What you're, what you're doing is deliberate and it's purpose, purposeful. Yeah. And, and rather, rather than haphazard. Right. All right. So we've, uh, we've, uh, this is an amazing conversation. Uh, I, I, I love these shows and, and we could talk forever on this, um, but <laughs> we don't have that much time. So I'm going to handle a little bit of business and we'll do some final thoughts. So uh, business for the channel. So we've got a couple things coming up. Uh, actually, uh, not this channel, but on Ask the Nights Live, I will be hosting this Thursday. Uh, Logan is, uh, uh, his actually Logan, his father passed away yesterday. Uh, and so I like, would like all our viewers to keep him in your thoughts. That is a Baron Logan Path Warden. Uh, he'll be traveling back to Virginia to be with his family and deal with all of that. So he asked me to take over his show again for him. Uh, and it is my honor to do so. I love Logan to death. and Great guy. So happy to do that. And I get to interview two amazing nights. So if you didn't get enough talking with nights tonight, uh, <laughs> tune in Thursday for Ask the Nights Live. Where I'll be joined by Graf Ulrich and Sir Eric Martell, who is the Knight of Kittens. Yes, I said the Knight of Kittens. <laughs> uh, they, so they also run the Hound and Stag show here in Meridier's uh, to just uh, right. talk about people who look the part and are really like those. Yeah, there's Knight. Those, those guys are Knights. Two amazing gentlemen. Um, all right, and then uh, next Sunday, uh, I'll be joined by Dame Cunahild de, de Libreri, uh, or Dame Cunahild. That Dame Cunahild. Uh, Dame Cunahild. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about religion in the SCA. Religion is, a, is one of those hot-button topics, and I wanted to talk about it. And uh, Cunahild does a lot of research into religion and sort of the sort of the, the, the mythos of it was and talks about it a lot. So we're going to talk about how it applies to the SCA. Uh, and then, of course, for the next 
uh, What Makes a Night series, we'll be joined by Between Two Peers host and uh, or my other guest host for Unpack Your Shit, Duke Duchess <laughs> Sir Helga, Her Grace uh, for Network. Your Grace. Your Grace. <laughs> I love Mr. Helga, man. I, I cannot get enough of Helga. She is just, uh, ugh. I, I, I hate I'm out in California, so I cannot hit her with a stick. Yeah. I'm excited you get out there one day and just give her one good smack. And then she's going to beat me into oblivion. And then have Havek beat me into oblivion and have Hansa beat me into oblivion. But, you know, it'll be a good day all around, I think. That's right. All right. Uh, so that's, that's what I've got. Uh, lastly, but not leastly, if you want to support everything we're doing here on KK Productions, Go to patreon.com backslash KK Productions and throw some money our direction. This stuff all costs money, uh, but we have some cool rewards. And not only are you supporting this channel, but you're supporting like five or six others and more to come. So we have a couple of new things launching here in the next few weeks that I'm not going to talk about yet, but there's stuff happening. And that's that. Yes, that's all the things. All right. So, gentlemen, final thoughts on looking the part. Tiernan, you go first. Uh, yeah, so the the thing that occurs to me is is talking through all of this. Uh, it can feel a little bit overwhelming. It, like, wow, that's a that's a big thing to have to live up to. And there's all this other stuff that goes into knighthood. And and how do we ever achieve that? And for me, it's take it one day at a time. Uh, make that next thing the thing that fits that that one part of your persona, that one part of your garb that you feel like it was just the thing that was missing, selling what you want um, to portray. Um, you don't have to do it all overnight, uh, just one day at a time, and I and you can get there. Yeah, yeah it's uh, th this sort of thing. The, the looking the part is definitely an evolution, and uh, it is a never-ending evolution. Um, you know, one of the things that I tell people frequently, you know, when they say, "How do I become part of the SEA?" and like, "How do I really get into it?" sort of thing is, you know, I I, I know some kingdoms are are less uh, have less. Um, influences to you know persona development really is isn't as important in some kingdoms um and others it is it is highly important um but for me i've always told people you know pick a time and a place within the medieval period and be that and you know find a book on you know what you what you want to be your your thing um the the virtual background that, I, that I'm using there is uh, uh, supposed to be the uh, Battle of Poitiers, um, which is the defining moment of my persona. Um, and I pick that, you know, I don't have a fully fleshed out persona story, but, you know, I have that particular battle as my culminating event. Hmm. And you buy a book on Poitiers and you read that and it leads you down the rabbit hole um, and follow the rabbit. <laughs> follow the white rabbit um oh. you know just go down that hole and and you know book after book after book is going to lead you to um the the, the stuff that that you want and and to help you find out uh, what you want to be and yeah pick a time and a place and be that um and yeah to Tiernan's point it is an evolution we don't you know we don't start here um, and, and I, I don't expect somebody who's, who's a knight to have, have that as fully fleshed out as I do after 30 plus years of being a knight. Um, and it's, you know, we, we are, we are very forgiving, um, in, in our expectations. Again, that, that reasonable attempt, um, but look like something, um, try to, try to look the part, try to understand that you are part of that production. You are part of that, that stage scene, um, be conscious of that. And, you know, as Taryn said, just keep trying to do it better every day um, because that in and of itself is is the is rewarding enough. Just, you know, trying to dress the part more and more every day is is that is that is worth it in and of itself. Yeah, yeah I think my, my final thoughts are, are you're just going to mimic that uh, make those intentional choices. And when, when you ask, oh, how do I do all of it? Well, how do you how do you eat an elephant? One, one bite at a time. time. That's all it is. Find, find that one thing, make that one thing, and get a hat. Hats are key. And, and get a hat. <laughs> there you go. All right, guys. Uh, so, Tiernan, thank you for joining us today. This is, You've been a, a pleasure. And again, thank you for filling in at the last minute. Uh, Sean has spoke highly of all of his squires, and he, and, and he is uh, he is definitely not wrong with you tonight. So thank you for coming out. Yeah, thank you for having me. I had a blast, and I'm glad I was able to help out. Yeah. And, and, Sean, thank you, of course, as always, for lending us your your, your years of wisdom. 
from the, oh, from the and, and thank you for for your production. I, I like I said, I really enjoyed this series. Uh, I think it's I think it's been really important for a lot of people. Um, and so I really appreciate all your effort making this happen. My pleasure. My pleasure. Of course, thank you to our audience for showing up. Uh, you guys make this what we are. Make sure to smash that like button, or as Logan says, flat snap that like button. <laughs> uh, subscribe, push that little notification bell, do all those things down in the comments. I don't know. I don't do this for a living, so push the buttons. Uh, but we'll be back next week and the weeks after that for a while. Uh, but for tonight, this has been Tiernan, Sean, and Cal in Cal Bar's Corner. Night, everybody. Have a good night, everybody.